you have just seen is one of the video clips, uh, the educational video clips we are using uh, during our uh, educational process. And it will be one of the methods that uh, in the proposal have been utilized and maybe some of you have received some, has, some of these uh, video clips. Now these video clips will be one of the ways or one of the methods and they will be um, sent to you through different stages and I'm going to explain that when I, go, when I will come to the program itself and what is the aim of such thing and what, we are, uh, what, what, what are the objectives and how we can assess and monitor those objectives. Now the, the major vision for genetic education for medical professionals obviously is to enhance or uh, to get high levels of genetic literacy among uh, uh, the medical professionals which will reflect positively on the prevention and uh, uh, decreasing the incidence of genetic disorders and birth defects at the end. Now why we need to, to give such uh, significant attention towards the genetic education? Now we need to understand that medical genetics is in its transition period from providing such care for a small percentage of people with rare disorders as used to be, to provide the whole health care to everyone. After the completion of the Human Genome Project, which has resulted in significant ongoing reduction of the cost of DNA sequencing, together with the availability of translation researches advancing, this has led to the need to implement genomic discoveries and technologies into the, the real practice of medicine. However, between the fast advances in genomic discoveries and the need to implement it in the clinical practice have created a gap between the available knowledge with, uh, with the clinician and their ability and capabilities to implement such thing in their real practice. And obviously that will limit the clinical adoption of genomic knowledge and practice in medicine. Now, globally, how to approach that in different institutes, a better understanding, of course, of the clinical implications of genomic discoveries is what is needed and it's quite essential. And this has to be through training genomics to all health professionals from all levels through a well-developed framework that will provide it or provide the development for what is, go what is called now genomic competencies. Let me give an example of how the advances in genomics and genomic technology reflect on our uh, clinical practice and the need to implement that in our daily clinical practice and uh, the significant gap I was just talking about, about it earlier. For example, if you look at, so there are certain mutations in the same gene that can cause same, or sorry, many different types. For example, let us talk about the Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the dystrophin gene. The dystrophin gene can, can cause Duchenne muscular dystrophy at the same time Pickard muscular dystrophy. But the difference is, after exploring the pathogenesis or the molecular pathogenesis of such gene, that we discover the total loss of the function, what's called amorphic, which is total loss of the gene function, will cause Duchenne muscular dystrophy, while partially inactive or hygomorphic mutation that cause hygomorphic function of the DNA will cause beta muscular dystrophy. The same thing will go for cystic fibrosis, CFTR. It can cause cystic fibrosis, and at the same time, the mutations of the same gene can cause isolated congenital bilateral absence of the one difference. I will come into details about direct bronchitis, <coughs> which causes Hutchinson disease and variable forms of uh, multiple nuclei nucleasing. So, these advances will change theories, will change even our uh, knowledge about what we used to know about uh, <coughs> the, the genetic causes or the relation between the phenotype and its genotype. And it's going so fast that we need to cope or to follow what's happening in the real world. Take this for example. There are some um, mutations in certain genes that can cause developmental anomaly phenotype, but at the same time, the affected individual with this mutation will be prone for certain cancers. <coughs> Let me take just one example, as I said earlier, the red bronchogene, as an example, that can cause Hirschebrands and at the same time cause multiple endocrine inflammation and thyroid carcinoma. Or let me say, it is the real pathology behind that. Now, the red uh, bronchogene is what we, what we call the membranes protein. It's uh, actually um, encodes for 
tiles in kinetic receptors. And its main function is to guide the signaling or the transduction signaling for cell growth and differentiation. Now, mutations in red protein gene will, will cause inhibition of the transport of the protein or the availability of the protein at the plasma membrane. Hence, the availability of such a protein for uh, function will be limited. And this will result in a reduction in the transformer activity <coughs> of multiple endocrine nucleotide to a protein. Now, the same mutations in this gene will also uh, result in insufficient migration of the ganglia to the distal part of the colon in what we know as Hirschberg disease pathology. Now, if you see the difference, the mutation that caused um, uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia is a sort of pneumorphic. Pneumorphic is another terminology which describe gaining of function. The mutation that happened in this gene has gained function or more function to that gene, which will result in this pathology. Why the mutation of the same gene that caused Hirschfeld is called hypomorphic, as I explained earlier, less function, or function is decreased. Now, the real practice of teaching for genetic education in uh, major international health institutes is in the form of genetic competencies. We are, I won't say that we, we, we are doing the same, but we took it as an ideal and we tried to adopt it according to our resources, our assessments, and our needs. But I, need, I, feel, I felt that I need to explain more about it to you. Now, competency actually is the realistic, the rational, the reasonable uh, utilization of all knowledge, clinical skills, technical expertise, moral values, emotions, and, and, and everything else that related to our practice in order to be more beneficial to the individuals and the community being served. Now, is it needed for all health professionals, those who be uh, entitled or enrolled in the genetic education programs, they need to be geneticists? No. But at least they need to appreciate and understand that the, the recent genomic discoveries and knowledge have created like a significant shift towards the public health of disease and it is related to the <laughs> And of course, uh, together with this, because we are not covering the clinical um, uh, issues, we are covering other sectors. So a definition of what's called public health genomics, it is the study and the application of the knowledge about that we are generated from uh, human genomes and genes and its relation to the environment in order to or in relation to what's, what, what is uh, currently uh, being provided as health disease for the population. So providing health disease for the general population by using the knowledge and the technologies uh, generated from the recent development in genetics. In short, <coughs> genomic competencies is to utilize and use and implement specific skills, all that is available for such things, and the knowledge also gained in public health genomics the previous definition. Uh, globally, there are seven components of uh, genomic competencies that they, they are following uh, in their programs. Of course, we, we try to um, you know, achieve some or as much as we can in order for our program to be accredited. Of course, number one is how to translate the complex genomic information and knowledge in the real practice or how to be used in the community-based health educational programs. And also at the same time, before translation, we need to facilitate all uh, the, the, the genomic education by any means, logistically and also through knowledge. We need also to develop um, a long-term plan in order to inc incorporate the genomics into health education services uh, that will cover all sectors. But before attempting, during and after also, we need to, uh, to conduct a continuous needs assessment for such community-based programs in order to uh, be more beneficial and to uh, achieve our awareness and also to limit the negative um, outcome that may result from such experience. And of course, advocacy. We need to advocate the program before and during because I realize that whenever we, uh, we start preparing for, for, for a talk, unless I go uh, after every sector or let me say a workshop or a gathering, I need to call them personally. I need to approach them personally. Um, and I understand that everybody is busy in his work. But uh, even though, even after talking to them personally, 
and spending more time explaining <coughs> the importance, the need to narrow that extending, ongoing extending gap, still the response is not really encouraging. But that will not stop us, we'll inshallah go more and more, and maybe find another way <coughs> for advocacy. Also, we need to integrate such programs into the already existing community-based educational program that will save time, efforts, and also finance your money. Uh, of course, to, uh, uh, to, be, uh, I mean, to achieve a uh, much more positive outcome, we need to uh, conduct evaluating and monitoring a plan for such implications. The genomic work phase competencies will cover certain sectors in health. Uh, in short, it will cover all public health professionals, public health professionals, those in the clinical services, those who are working in population-based health education, and those also involved in epidemiology and data collection. Uh, it will cover also public health professionals <coughs> in environmental health. It will cover public health work in the laboratory services, and also, and most important, as I believe, the health decision makers, leaders, and administrators. Now, um, it's, it's a long way to explain the significant points in every sector, what they need to do and what they need to learn about and how they can share for the success of the whole program. But I'll try to be fast. In general, for all health public uh, work phase that will cover the whole circle I just mentioned, the program is aiming to make them, those workers, able to demonstrate the basic knowledge of genomics and to understand how this can play a very important role in developing a disease. They need to identify their own limits so they will, they will be able uh, efficiently to target what they need to learn about and how they can participate. And also, uh, they need to be, have, have that kind of ability <coughs> to refer certain cases to it is the uh, most appropriate uh, specialist that also to maximize the service and to minimize the, the harms. For all health, uh, public health professionals in general, I'll just go uh, uh, fast. Of course, every sector, every sector in, uh, in, in those who are providing or health care deliveries, they need also to apply the same idea, apply basic uh, genomic concepts, including to understand the pattern or the mode of inheritance and the relation or the integration between gene, the gene and environment interactions, the role of genes in causing the disease and the preventive, and preventive uh, measures. Also, they need to understand and appreciate the ethics and social, religious, and uh, medical limitations in, during their practice. They need to have ongoing updates of their own knowledge in order to, be, in order to minimize that uh, gap I just told you about. And of course, they need to understand and appreciate the role of cultural, social, behavioral, environmental, and genetic factors in developing the disease, uh, which will lead uh, eventually to preventive measures, understand the preventive measures. During their experience, they are the best one to know about their own um, situation, so they will have the ability to participate in strategic plan, uh, policy planning to implement the programs. Uh, they should have also the capability and the, the appreciation to collaborate with all sectors that may help at the end uh, to make the program succeed. And again, they need to evaluate also their, the ongoing program in their departments for better effectiveness. And at the end, they need to develop protocol to, uh, um, to, to like, like in the form of informed consent to for human subject to protection and research to minimize the harm and to be up to date. For uh, competencies that cover clinical services, the same idea, <coughs> the same, but this will be more in details. They need to understand the basic of genetics. They need to understand also how to demonstrate it um, and, and look for the indication of the component and to consider their resources. Again, they need to be care about, or careful about the ethical, legal, social, and financial issues. So if, if, if they want to plan, for example, long term, they need to the, assess their needs, assess their resources through the data they are gathering um, in order to have a you know, realistic outcome. Um, also, they need to explain basic concept of probability and risk and benefits of diseases. They need to have the skills and the maneuvers to, to, to deliver genomic information to their staff. Public health competencies for epidemiology and data management, the same idea, but more in concentration of how to collect the data and how this data can be uh, like uh, um, to initiate uh, correction of the program and to initiate also targeting the, the most ap uh, appropriate and the priority uh, of, of, of targets. Um, for competencies that will cover population-based health education, those programs that like in primary health care, uh, they also need to be involved. 
and uh, they are also uh, we 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 already enrolled them in, in the program. Um, basically, actually, uh, they are the best ones to the advocacy for the success of the program. Uh, laboratory science, because they are a major component of uh, health education or the uh, in the molecular aspect, so they need to, uh, to to be also involved and enrolled in order to help in in the program, and also they need to develop the genomic skills and technology knowledge among their staff. Uh, of course, environmental health. Uh, this sector actually describes how the environment can, uh, can uh, you know, interact with the gene. As you remember, the figure between the environment and the gene. So they are the best one to uh, be involved in it. Advocacy, again, also is important. Now, the health leaders and administration and, administration and decision makers, we uh, started like approaching them personally like DGs in the ministry, DGs in the region, and uh, you know, most of them are uh, non-medical. So, but, but, but talking and explaining why it's important and vital to train their staff um, on, on, uh, on genetics um, in all sectors, and how this will improve their clinical understanding, how this will improve their clinical judgment, and how it will improve also, as I said, er er appropriate reference to uh, manage the cases. They accepted that. And through this mutual understanding between the decision makers and the program uh, leaders, I think, I think the success will be, inshallah, as we expected. Now, we'll go to the genetic education proposed program made by the National Genetic Center. We have put certain objectives to achieve, general and specific. The most important one in the general objectives I'm just listing here is actually to, to develop uh, a comprehensive and ongoing plan, well-integrated system to achieve the continuous medical education in genetics or genomic knowledge and in the technical um, uh, expertise as well. And this to cover certain uh, divisions of genetics, community genetics, clinical genetics, cytogenetics, and molecular genetics. And I believe understanding such things and understanding the, patho the pathogenesis of how the relation between the phenotype and the genotype, and how the mutations in the same gene can cause different phenotypes, and how one mutation in the same gene can cause uh, different phenotypes. So by, by having the whole knowledge and, and in a simple way, now we understand or we used to uh, have a preoccupied idea that genetics is really complicated. Um, it is not. Actually, it is, it is quite simple as long as we know the basics, as long as we have the you know, the, 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 the needs and the, the, the resources to implement it. And I think that will be more, will make the whole process much easier, inshallah. Of course, uh, all medical professionals need, we need to increase their awareness and the use of genetic services. Uh, the same thing, as I said earlier, about uh, genetics in the common uh, genetic disorders and syndromes. And we want them also to be more confident when providing the services to the public. Now, meeting with patients and uh, having all these ideas of genetic knowledge and expertise to implement and to explain, like in genetic counseling, for example, in uh, drawing with degrees, all this core competence, we need to make our professionals more confident in, and also effectively integrate such uh, education in the public health system. Specifically, uh, we need to improve what is, what is already existing in the services. Um, also, we need to assure the translation of such knowledge and technical um, expertise to the clinical practice. And also, uh, we need to minimize the wrong refer reference uh, that happens uh, you know, from time to time in here that the patient is being referred to, not, not to the right uh, speciality. So wasting time and wasting resources. Also, we need to make our professionals to be able to recognize immediate and past clinical clues that may suggest specific conditions. So after that, the process of management will be, and the counseling will be easier. And of course, we train them on how to use the degree sample because that will, will sort a lot of uh, queries when approaching the families. Um, and then identify the mode of inheritance, identify certain families with uh, obsessive disorders, and providing genetic counseling, and in the near future, the premarital testing for, uh, for careers and to explain how these conditions will be prevalent in certain populations. That is part of the community genetics or population genetics aspect. However, we do have certain you know, difficulties and obstacles that we need to admit. 
but this will not stop, inshallah, us from uh, going on. We'll, we'll, we have to move on. <coughs> and uh, of course, number one is possible for limited resources. You know, when, when it comes to genetics, we need to have a significant financial budget. And that's the main issue when we discuss with the decision makers and leaders. But there is a way how to approach that. I, um, we found that if the decision, decision makers is not that person who will, you know, every time will say no when it comes to money. No. We need to convince them or convince uh, the decision maker of that issue that this will eventually decrease the burden of the diseases and of course at the end it will also minimize the money being expended on th and that part or that, uh, that group of uh, affected uh, persons or affected patients. So at the end you will, you will regain the resources back to other services. Now by extending it in a mutual understanding way in also using illustrative diagrams, I think I think they will listen well, and I think we'll get what we want. Again, we have to admit that we have an adequate data, and of course, to plan any uh, program to be more efficient, you need to have uh, a well-formed data, realistic data. But I feel that in genetics, we don't have, or let me say, we we have inadequate data. And um, again, insufficient number of trained uh, health professionals in the area. Now, what we are trying to do is to try to train our staff. Uh, well, I won't call it an ideal training, but we try to do something about it. And uh, like to say, put them in the track so they can move, inshallah, easier in the future. When it comes to genetic services, and uh, there are other priorities that may compete. Now, I remember I talked to one of my colleagues with uh, Dr. Mushtaba. I tried to invite him to visit uh, happily, to visit the National Genetic Center to have an idea of how things are going there. And then he shouted at me, and he said that we need the resources for something else. And actually, he's right. If you, listen, if you just uh, appreciate the idea he's talking about, he's right. He needs money for other important competing priority in order to provide the service. <coughs> but on the other hand, if he could listen to me more and give me time for running away, you could understand that if you enrich the genetic services knowledge, preventive measures, that at the end will, will reflect and, or will have a positive impact that will minimize the needs of uh, money or need of finance that you need to treat other patients. Now, if, uh, we started actually to identify recessive disorders families. And we, by a way or another, screened some of the careers. And by a way or another, we gave a genetic counseling of those careers. So we prevent more affected individuals in that particular family. So again, we, we limited the cost that you, will, you have to pay. At the, end, at the end, you will have to pay the cost to give a care of that affected baby. So he's right, and I'm right. And inshallah, we'll, we'll sit and we'll sort it out. Um, of course. Yeah, the cultural, social, religious limitations we need to understand and appreciate. We need to work with. I won't call this obstacles actually, but uh, it's more like misunderstanding. So maybe uh, with, with uh, more involvement in the community and involving leaders of these sectors in the program, I think this will, will, will help uh, more. We thought of what would be the efficient inter interventions or ways or methods to achieve such goals. To design a program for teaching, we did that. And also to conduct uh, like um, targeted, basic, clinically oriented courses, we did that. And we uh, now uh, try to integrate the, the education on applied genetics through the Ministry Health Program. We did some of that, especially in Down syndrome. And uh, also we need to incorporate the genetic services in the primary health care system. We tried that. We are, uh, you know, in every uh, gathering or meeting we call uh, the DG of primary health care to come and see the situation in the, in the, in the, in the center and we try to share different ideas with him and he's responding very well. So I think we achieved some of this stage. Now, you know, some of our colleagues, they missed out uh, genetic educations. Again, I believe those we need to be, uh, need to be targeted through uh, um, a CME session. <coughs> and of course, every program has to be evaluated and audited, uh, but we need to select uh, the most appropriate and realistic objective to uh, evaluate on. Uh, we ask the participants also to give their feedbacks, and that's quite helpful. 
Um, I, I tried also after the end of every workshop, I conduct like a mini quiz to the audience. And I, I was really scared that this, they may dislike that because you are asking them and you expect them to answer. But they liked it. And that was really give me, um, you know, like encouragement for every workshop to conduct like mini quizzes, uh, to, <coughs> which will cover all the lectures being given. And of course, immediate feedback during chatting with them. So this is the, the program we made and uh, it's being updated. It's not in the uh, final version. Um, we listed the objectives specifically and uh, in general. As you can see, this is the table. Are you able to see one or shall I switch up lights? Lights off? Oh. It's, it's not going to help. It's okay? It's okay. Very small. Read it. Just read it. <coughs> Wait. Okay. Uh, as you can see, this the list of departments that are covered in our uh, proposed program. Whenever uh, I meet the head of department, like Dr. Said, I looked for him and I went inside the ICU and yani, thankfully he really welcomed me. So we discuss and chat what we need to do and how we're going to do it. So we put a tick like you know, it is done on this particular day. Now the follow up. Follow up is when I come here uh, every Sunday in the clinic, I try to meet my colleagues. So I meet one of them, uh, he's also sitting here with us right now. And every time I ask him, have you seen the clips? Uh, do you have any idea? Or to, the answer is always, I'm busy. But some of them did see the clips and they gave uh, different ideas like well, we need to minimize the time, uh, uh, clips need to, for one, one gave me a very good idea that why don't we translate the, the clips into Arabic? So I believe, uh, we, we inshallah will do that, we'll try to do, to do that using our resources. To use those clips for the public. Okay, um, here we plan to conduct like one hour, one and a half, two hours workshop after the end of the 20 stages of weekly educational uh, video clips uh, for the Department of Child Health and the Department of, we call it an adult. That will cover medicine, radiology, <coughs> cardiothoracic, oncology, and everything. So just for um, one hour talk, and maybe it will extend to two hour talk according to their available time. Now to do that, we decided uh, in that we started in 2015. So this is the department name. There will be a focal point like a CMA coordinator in every department to coordinate with, done and follow up. So we want to, at the end, produce like a document that such training has been given to this department, so the evaluation will come after, inshallah. <coughs> we made, this is just an example, we made 20 stages of uh, educational video clips, and as you can see with different titles, basic of genetics, one and two, the cell one, the cell one and two, uh, in genetic counseling, in population genetics, in how to draw uh, pedigree symbols, in chromosomes, in DNA, in the mutation, it's a long list. Now, if you may realize that we have sent a few for uh, maybe three groups of video clips and we stopped. We stopped because at the meantime we are collecting emails that will cover the whole <coughs> country. So we want to do it uh, at the same time, like sending them to the same, uh, to the group, sending the same clips to the whole <coughs> groups in the country. But inshallah we will start soon. <coughs> These are the topics to be covered in that short time workshop I told you about for the child health department after the 20 stages and these are the titles to cover the adult physician as i said oncologist uh, hematologist um, radio radiologist uh, cardiothoracic and i want to show you an example of these clips in this animation we'll see the remarkable way our dna is tightly packed up so that six feet of this long molecule fits into the microscopic nucleus of every cell The process starts when DNA is wrapped around special protein molecules called histones. The combined loop of DNA and protein is called a nucleosome. Next, the nucleosomes are packaged into a thread. The end result is a fiber known as chromatin. This shows actually DNA packing. This fiber is then looped and coiled yet again. Finally, to the familiar shape. 
shapes known as chromosomes, so it goes from the gene which can be seen in the nucleus of dividing cells. Chromosomes are not always present. They form around the time cells divide when the two copies of the cell's DNA need to be separated. See the separation now? Clearly. Visually. program we made for the coming year. <coughs> uh, of course, um, you will be involved, announcement will come to you uh, to share and uh, attend uh, <coughs> this event. Uh, we need to give this to the CMA department, uh, Mr. Khabar, to be able to help us with the logistically. Now, Another idea that we, uh, as you may know, that we don't have a qualified genetic counselor. We have maybe one or two, one in here, just recently she arrived, and one in university. And how important and vital is the genetic counseling services? Now, we know that it's part of our medical education. We have to, or we've been trained how to give uh, counseling um, using the, the, the right language, the right terminology, and to be more accurate or using more accurate diagnosis. But we don't have a qualified professional genetic counselors. Now, shall we stop? If we start, uh, you know, asking the decision makers, it will take more time, you know, it has to be included for the coming year plan or five year plan, but we need to move. So we just proposed a program that inshallah it will be uh, implemented by the 2015 <coughs> uh, As you know, um, we, there, is, there will be an international course at the university in April. Um, so we decided, to enroll 10 of the ministry, 10 candidates from the Ministry of Health. So from every region, from every river hospital, one candidate to be enrolled in that two weeks international academic affiliation uh, program. And uh, after that, we'll conduct like a local course at the genetic uh, or national genetic center. And in that course, we'll spend six months extensive training, three days in every month. So this, those candidates will come to us every month for three days. One will be at the clinics, you know, they have to watch and real practice like and <coughs> laboratory, and then they uh, will, will conduct like an extensive uh, lectures and demonstrations for them, and so on. These candidates will act, will work, yes, as the genetic counselors, but also they will collaborate with us, National Genetic Center from their regions. This is the program we made, uh, and uh, this was uh, designed and made by one of our staff, Sister Saida. And as you can see here, most of the uh, objectives, general and specific. Here, the modules. We make like the modules and every day, they have to cover these topics, either in the lab or the clinic or in the teaching session <coughs> for six months. Now, you may know that uh, in every time we have a meeting with the, the, the decision makers at the, at the ministry, and every time they ask us what you want, they are good listeners actually. Us, yeah. But we, we talk to them that we, uh, in order to perform such a program, you need to have, um, you know, we need to require some essential items, let me say. <coughs> and of course, number one is that results of financial resources, <coughs> logistics, supplements, training stuff, and etc. And et um, I suggested to format like an, um, a genetic education national committee. We don't have that. So in order to perform the genetic or genomic competency program, which is really huge, which is really globally being implemented, and we need to be part of that, we need to have a national uh, committee. They agreed on that, but we'll see. We have to follow up with them. And of course, we need to format like focal points in the regions. And those, uh, we need to activate more national workshops and programs, and, 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 and international as well. This is, we created like a YouTube channel for uh, the National Genetic Center. So every talk, we uh, try to videotape, and uh, slides also we try to convert it to our videos, and then we publish in this channel with, it, with its title. So if you enter the channel, just write National Genetic Center, inshallah you will see all the talks and all the presentations that have been given so far uh, in, 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 in the teaching sessions. And of course, we have also our demonstration videos 
We have a video that describes the laboratory services. And inshallah, in the near future, we're going to have more illustrated videos. We believe that visualize it, it will be make it more simple and more easy and to reach uh, to the public, to reach to our medical professionals colleagues, inshallah. <coughs> this is the website of the YouTube channel. And that's all. Thank you very much.